I was in so much pain that I've been disconnected from my family for so many years. The people that said they were gonna they put their hand up to look after me when I get here, they decided to put their hand down. I had nowhere to go. I had no one that I could turn to and say, man, I'm going through these obstacles and I can't find a way to overcome them. That's Chance. I promise you've never met anyone quite like him. The Congo native fled war-torn Africa as a child, leaving his family and everything he'd ever known behind him. I felt very isolated. I felt like there wasn't anyone there for me. When Chance finally made it to Australia, he thought he'd be in paradise, but in reality, life was hell. The first place that I ever had to sleep in was worse than jail, you know? How the system is like here, you know, they treat harmless people as people that ain't worth it, people that ain't valid. Homeless, traumatized, and a world away from the only people who loved him, Chance had every reason to give up, but that's not how this story goes. I was so hungry for it. I wanted to get out there and inspire as many people as I can. Now he's running his own mental health and disability care business, and he's just published a book on mentoring, solidifying his true passion for helping others. <laughs> this is Chance, an author, man. An author and also a CEO of Everyone Has a Story to Tell. Welcome to Young Blood, an award-winning podcast on a mission to make the mental health of young men a top priority. My name's Callum McPherson, I'm a journalist, and this is our platform to open up and share stories of what we've been through because we're not alone. Let's do it. Trigger warning, if you find anything spoken about in today's episode distressing, please contact Lifeline on 13 11 14. So Chance, take us back to the Congo. When you were a boy, if we could see through your eyes back then, what would we have seen? A uh, totally different person to who I am today. I come from the Congo when I was 12. I was pretty little when I um, had to travel from like one place to a different place to come to Australia. So I moved to Kenya, Nairobi with my cousin's wife. And then from there, I ended up coming here. But uh, without saying, there was a lot of obstacles through that before I got here. We had to flee war a few times, which was really hard at the time. Who were you running from when you were like six years old and you were still with your parents? When I was really young, um, there was a war between the uh, Houthi and the Tutis, two different tribes in the Congo. And there was always war between the two. So um, we were running away, trying to find a better place where we could stay. At first, it was like running from places to places within the Congo and then end up going back to where we started again. The war, it's something that was coming in and then stop within like a few months and then started again. And then we have to find ourselves doing the same thing over and over again. So, um, so you'd find somewhere, feel safe for a, a few months, but then it would turn up again and you'd have to go find another spot. But then we go back home. And then when the war start again, then we'll, we'll go and find another place again. I don't know where unexpectedly just start hearing gunshots, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, really at the end of it, it's up to your parents to kind of start coming up with solutions and um, start looking for places where, you, where the whole family can go. Do you remember the first time you were scared for your life? The first time I was scared for my life, um, was when one of my aunties got shot, you know. Uh, she was carrying me when we were running away. I was really little at the time. And then um, she got shot in the leg, which is a, it's an injury that she still have until today. Mm. So, um, but again, uh, with that saying, after that Hattie, I always go back where we had like our own places, you know. Yeah. How do they view life and death in the Congo? differently to say here in Australia? Yeah, it's totally differently. Um, in terms of uh, some people are happy with the smallest thing that they can, they, they might have in their hands and some people want more. And um, again, I came from the Congo, one of the richest, the richest place in the world. I mean, otherwise, um, in terms of resources and stuff, there's always wars going on there. So alive there, it's not really as sustainable as it's supposed to be over here. So there's always someone that died or there's always someone that got shot. In terms of like death wise, uh, the Congo, it's known, known for the music and also celebrations and stuff. So if someone was, was to die, really, we don't, we don't like gather around and really cry about it, but people celebrate for um, that person being there and then 
to like the last day, like today's the last day they're gone. They do uh, like a yearly celebration to remember that person where family can gather together with neighbors and just like have a bit of a yarn. And it's really different over there, I would say, compared to here. Yeah. How do you become separated with your family? Yeah, so um, I was sent away to come to study. So basically what happened was my cousin that lives here had his wife over there and um, they wanted for me to go and study, um, to come here and study and see if I could better live for the rest of my family members. But it was the case that only one of your family could go. Yeah, right? that was the case. So, uh, so 12 kids, fun, but only one could yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. So the, you're the chosen one. Yeah, the fun part of that was, um, so there was two, my brother and my sister, right? It was one or the other. So um, I think the whole idea was for my oldest brother to come to Australia to study here. And then he's already like throwing all his stuff away, like he's ready to go out there to like to move countries and stuff. And then at the last minute, literally on the day that we're meant to like take the boat and like go away, they say Chance is the one that is going. How did and he like, take that? And I was like, I don't want to go. You know, because um, I just start imagining things like, look, I got fa I got family, I got good friends here, I'm happy with my life, you know. Who said that uh, you were the one that was going to go? This is what I heard from dad, because it was just me and dad at the time, and mom was away for business. So she used to go away for businesses for like four, four ages, and then she would come back after like a month or so. And the same as dad, but that month, dad was staying at home with us. So, um, so I was like, no, nah, I don't want to go. And then dad was just like, yeah, you have to go. We're going to go buy you some stuff and then take this stuff with you. And then... Um, Why did dad choose you? Off. I'm not too sure. I think that was where my cousin said that it was going to be a great idea if I was to go. But again, at that time, I never really met my cousin. Probably we met when I was really little. I ended up accepting it. How old are you at this point? I was around like, well nine ten years at that time yeah so we're moving from places to places went to a refugee camp in uganda kampala which was like really hard and um and it took a lot longer for you to get to australia than you thought it was yeah going to, yeah right? definitely i thought uh, like we're gonna get here within like a, a week or a couple of weeks time but i was like he's he is jenny man and uh throughout the whole journey yes. how long did it take to get uh, here uh since we're 20 2008 um until i think 2011 why did it take so long 2011 or 2012 ish um it took so long because we went through different borders so africa is a big country and we have to travel by buses to places so i first went to uganda a refugee camp was staying there for a bit but things weren't going as good in there because our life was pretty difficult over there um, there's like no no clean water, no, yeah. no food to eat. Yeah, so there was no clean water, no food, as you might you can imagine. And also, there's other people in there. The local members of the of the place really never wanted to associate with people that weren't from the local area. So mm. it was really difficult. And then from there, we end up moving back to Kampala, and then we stayed there for a little while in the city in Kampala, and then uh, the city of Uganda, and then from there we moved to Kenya. What was the life for you being that age and every day waking up knowing that you still weren't in Australia? It was supposed to happen ages ago and it wasn't meant to be the way that it was and you just went from one place to the other to the other to the other but you're still stuck in Africa. Pretty difficult because there was lack of education as well. Um, when I was with mom and dad studying and but uh, again throughout the whole journey there was an education there so I lacked education. Uh, that was my biggest worry because I wasn't going to school or anything, and like traveling you know, for such such a long period of time, hoping that I'm gonna get to Australia. There was some stage where I was like, "Now nah, I want to go back. I want to go back where I come from. I want to go back to the Congo and um, go back to my family. You know, I think life would be a lot more better there." I was saying this to because um, you were stuck in between wife. for so long. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I lost the patience and. Um, start saying look i need to go back there was certain times where i took my stuff and i didn't even know where i was going put them on my shoulders and start walking not easy to get back there uh, yeah it, it wasn't easier so i was like i'm gonna walk back home if it's gonna take me whatever years or or days or 
oh so ever i'm gonna walk back because mentally i wasn't coping well being away from your family for such a period of time and no contact no phone contact or anything for like a long time you just feel isolated you know and um how do you describe the, the pain of that for you the way i'll describe that is like um i felt very isolated i felt like there wasn't anyone there for me uh emotionally or um anyone that i could like go to and speak to about how i'm feeling and express my my emotions to them say um it's something that really i had to do with as a young as a young child which was a I would consider it as a trauma, you know, it's a trauma that I lived with for a long time. What did that um, do to your heart? Uh, I, I, I felt like a sense of um, not belonging, really, like um sense of disconnection with um, the people that I truly loved and the people that were meant to be part of my life, which... Like you didn't belong anywhere? Yeah, yeah, which is my family, you know, so you go to places and people... Um, are so conscious with their kids playing with you guys simply because you're from this country which is so called the Congo you know it was pretty difficult at the time but um the way I manage it uh, it's just really I just keep looking up into the sky and hoping for the best yeah did you believe things would get better I'll be honest with you I never really believed that things would get better the only way that I think things are gonna get better is if I was to go back to my roots if I was to go back to mom and dad and where I could be able to see my family regardless of if we had we had or never had anything but being there in prison you would have been being together able to see them could have been a lot better for me you know um, and I've, so why what stopped you going back to your family because i just couldn't do it man it was it was uh, it was um it was like such a long journey from mm. from like nairobi to like the congo you know it's and imagine walking by myself i was only like what uh, i think 11 at the time so those times you got then, fed off yeah. those times you got fed up and like ran away how far did you get before you turned around i walked for about i would say 10 hours i walked for 10 hours and then and the reason why I worked for 10 hours was because there was an argument at the house where I was at between me and my cousin's wife. And and there was an argument between the two of us. He said, I was, I was like, I don't feel connected. I don't feel belonging. Anyways, you guys, no one really cares. So uh, the only way is to try to get back home. I was like 11 at the time, walking back home to a place where I've never really walked. You know what I'm saying? Like, I kind of like try to find my way out back in the Congo about 10 hours later I realized like it's too far too far I end up too walking back yeah. you know I end up walking back so yeah what did you imagine Australia would be like oh um that's, that's a good question um you know how to portray the western world in mm. the medias and also our movies and stuff I uh, probably really I could imagine Australia as a, a place a, a, like a free place where you can go to and socially engage with anyone and anybody like with neighbors and and the way you like kind of see movies and you see kids riding their bikes and knocking on other kids doors and say hey, let's go for bike rides or like go for walk or go do these things but so have you seen any movies relating to australia or you heard yes, about I, australia i've seen a lot of movies related to australia and also i've heard about australia because my um uh cousin lives here as well he's been here for a little while and I had a few other friends that moved from the Congo to here too. So, so you thought it would be like a paradise? Yeah, yeah I thought it would be like a paradise somewhere where like uh, you have like a free life, you know, you're like um, you're like you're at peace with your inner self, and that there will never be any problems or so ever. It's just like when you see those movies, you know. I remember a movie there, sir, was Matilda, you know, Matilda, and that's what I could imagine Australian be Australia be like, you know walking walking to your neighbor's door taking your bike and take other kids for bike rides you all but just go and have fun but hey what i came it was a different story did you envision the life that you wanted for yourself at that time so still in africa just about to move to australia were you thinking about the kind of life that you wanted to live or had you just been in survival mode too much to even imagine it i would say i was in the survival mode for too too much but uh like the life that i might imagine having here was um that free life, that freedom to really be happy and um, engage and connect with different people and 
just just expand my knowledge on certain things because um the more you travel the more people you meet the different your mindsets becomes so that's what i was i was hoping for and that's what i had in my mind but uh it was absolutely different when i came here yeah so when you did arrive what was the plan well so i was blank i was i was happy that i arrived in australia don't get me wrong but again there was this side of me that was saying i'm disconnected from my roots you know uh australia is a long way from the congo yeah, and it, it is a long way um by by flying it's a long way by walking it's a long way there's no way to walk <laughs> by there. walking it's a very long yeah, way yeah so um i i was I, I still felt like isolated even though i felt happy being here but again a part of me was like this is no place for you you know mm. yeah like i didn't really feel belonged but and then when I start seeing different coaches and stuff, and I was like, yeah, this is different, you know, because I never really had so like much. Like seeing that it was yeah. multicultural and there yeah. was people from all over the world mm. in Australia. Yeah. Mm. But in terms of who you stayed with when you got here and how that was all supposed to work, like what was the plan for that? Uh, so that was very interesting because they wanted us, so it was me and a few other people that we, we all came together where I'm going to talk about myself. It's like, they were um book focused a lot they wanted us to just attend school school home and um was it a family member a, that you were staying with yes yeah it was a uh, um first cousin first cousin that i was staying with so they said like this is australia this and this is what happened so so first they spoke to us but to me about um the warnings and, and things that occurs occurred and they said hey you're gonna be staying here. You have two things: school and home. No and life then, outside of and that. Church. That's mm. it. That's it. School, home, church. Because they were really scared about other influences and how that might corrupt you guys, or you might go down the wrong path. Or what yeah. was their mindset? Yeah, I think they saw how other communities, other like African communities, are. All the kids, how they interact within the society when they get to Australia, and how they engage within the community. Say they, I think they were scared that we're gonna end up turning, turning to be like those kids. Um, like end up in gangs or uh, in yeah, trouble with the police. End up or? in trouble with it. Yeah, we we'll like um, what do you call it? End up with trouble with the community and end up in trouble with the government. And but I, what I would say is these people really valued. Um, there uh how would i say they really valued the people that they were and also they valued um the reputation i would say more than the anything image, else yes like how they looked so, yeah yeah so they wanted for for me to kind of like be the ad idea of what they think a good kid might be like uh -huh. Yeah, it said that rather was than who you actually were. Yeah, rather than me being who I am, you know what I mean. Uh, maybe they were also what I what I got from that is that they were fearful that we're probably gonna end up turning bad, mm. you know. And I had all this. I've heard a lot of stuff about myself and uh, them talking about me and how they think I'm gonna end up turning. So they wanted to fit you in a very little box because yeah. they were afraid that. If they didn't, then you could turn into anything that they wouldn't be able to control. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And mm. I think that was the case. That was the case when I first got here. Um, what impact did that have, though, on you having to come here thinking it was going to be paradise and you're going to be off riding your bike and make all these friends and have this great life? And then it didn't feel like that. It didn't. It didn't feel like that. Well, the impact that I had on me was, psychologically speaking, was, was big. Um, I didn't feel belonging, sense of belonging. The only freedom I ever had was when I was in school in the school ground. Um, that's the only freedom that I ever had when I when I first when I came here. And then, on top of that, it's like I was being put on side aside, and nothing of mine really mattered. Not even my um, emotional needs or anything that I really wanted to get done wasn't really being met. So, uh, so I kind of like had to hold in there for as long as I could, you know, because um, I knew nobody, nobody here, you know, I wouldn't say 
I was going to go to this person, knock on their door, and they'll help me out because I don't understand. I never really understood the situ uh, their system at the time, the Australian system, and how how things are run, you know. What were the sort of things that you, you wanted to do but you weren't allowed to do? Yeah, um, so I was like big on sports. I wanted to really do sports. Uh, in terms of soccer, I love playing soccer, and I say, I start getting in a bit of footy when I was new here. Because um, uh, when I was new here, I went to secondary school of English to do English course over there. Mm. So when I first arrived, I was like, oh, I can't, I can't wait. I'm going to be playing this. I'll be playing soccer. I'll be playing footy, blah, blah, blah. And then eventually I started playing footy and soccer for the school. But a lot of the time, the training were, they were after school, you know. And you were supposed to be home straight yeah, away. Yeah, I was supposed to be home straight away. And then I can recall like, the first time I ever went to a footy, a footy training without letting them know. I think I text, I said, look, I'm going to be running late because I got to go to this footy training. I didn't get no response back, you know. So, uh, the f so when I went in there to actually um, train, uh, I mean, to do my footy training and stuff, um, the training ended up finishing around 6 p.m. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And when I went back at home, it was a different story. I had to get punished. What say, was the say, punishment? Say, um, it's, it's one of those stand, standing where you uh, you put your your legs up and then your head down. I don't know what you call, what do you call that. It like has a hand a terminology for it. It's like a handstand type of thing where your legs, your foot, is connected to the wall so a leg like i would call it a leg stand but um they'd so make you there do this for like an hour they made you do this physical punishment yeah i was there for like an hour you know sweating and i was just like man what was the point of this this is this is like a jail you know uh, was what like were they a, saying to you so well if, as long as you live in here you follow our rules just because you, you know? wanted to go to footy training yeah that's i went to foot training with, with that Pretty the standard stuff that kids want to do though, play yeah. sport at their school and yeah. they weren't getting in any trouble. Yeah, but with that said, this isn't just from them, this is like a stuff that occurs with a lot of migrants. Like a lot of people that migrate from like a different country to Australia, so, so I was like, yeah, that's fair. And you felt like you couldn't go and tell anyone outside of that house about what was happening there? Um, like anyone at the school? Or? I couldn't, but I think I recall once I had a bit of a chat with my... Um, English teacher at the time because I was doing an intensive English class and in, in English lessons and I went to chat to my English teacher and I told her like look this is this, 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 what, what is going on and then I went and talked to the people that I was living with so because they spoke mm -hmm. to them about the whole situation I was like oh geez and then they came and talked to me about it and then I was did like, they punish you for that they didn't but uh the way they kind of approached the situation was like in a in an uh, aggressive ways to make me feel that what was I doing? You know what I'm saying? Say so, uh, so I had to kind of like from that day, I was just like, cool. I would just keep it to myself and just casually mind my own business, you know? Yeah. So when did you get away from that living environment? Yeah, yeah, I did really. I, I wanted to for a long time, always saying to myself, by the time I hit 18, I'll be gone because that's the, that's the age range here. How many um, years were but, you there? Um, I think I was with them for about four years. Mm. Four, yeah, I would say to about four years. Um, yeah, four years. Yeah, I was with them for four years. At the it's house. a long time to yeah, carry that to, weight of feeling yeah, impressed. Yeah, because so, so, it's as always like everything you do, you have to impress them, you know, apart from the one thing and the one thing only was just education wise that's that's up to you mm. you know they'll push you to go to school but they just want you to go leave the house go to school you know but again yeah nobody but you really, felt like they didn't really care about you they just cared about the result that you went and got from your studies they didn't really care i don't think they cared about my results that i was getting from my studies my studies either because uh whatever i do i had to do it by myself I have to look at myself motivation because I was always hoping like, look, I'm here with no biological family beside me, you know, no mom, no dad, no brothers to turn to. If anything was to go wrong for me, I'm gonna turn up I'm gonna end up turning back to my cousins, you know, the people that I was living with. So that's the only thing that was always in my mind. And I'm always like, if I leave, where am I gonna go? You know? Mm -hmm. What if I get sick out there? What if this happened to me, you know? 
Yeah, and that's... so you really you knew that you would be on your own and there would be no one that could come and save you if, if you needed it. Yeah. And that made you feel trapped, like you had to sort of, you had to stay where you were. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. So I was very, I was pretty trapped in that, did that you, environment. How did you feel about actually thing. going to school? Like, did you enjoy I school? did, I did enjoy school because it was a bit of a getaway for me, really. Because once you have um, the opportunity where you can like be separated from the things that, um, that you think they're holding you back from being who you're supposed to be, then you have that joy within yourself. And that's how I felt. Every single day when I was working up to go to school, I used to be up about 5 a.m. in the morning. 5 a.m. in the morning, I make sure that I get stuff done. I make sure that um, the house is clean, the kids' food is ready to take to school. Myself, I'm ready for school at seven, by 7 o'clock, 7.30ish. I have to be out of the house. Mm. You so know? you're taking it seriously. Yeah, yeah, because uh, the there was a kid in the house and I have to help them out. I'll do the morning routine, uh, pick up lunch for the kids for school, pick up my own stuff, take my so bike. So you were in like a parent a, type role? Yeah, yeah. By the time that I leave the house to go to school, I feel like I'm a free spirit, you know. I can go there and just be myself, you know. But you so left that house when you were still at school. The way that happened is I got kicked out at home. I was at work, I went to work, and then after work, go my way at home. I bumped into a friend of mine in the public and then they were like, you want to go for coffee? I was like, a first I was thinking, man, if I go for coffee, how long is this going to take? Just in case I get kicked out of home and I don't have anywhere to go. Because so you had, had a to, curfew. Yeah, yeah, time yeah I had a curfew. Home. I had to be at home. So to, uh, by four o'clock, I think was the latest. Four o'clock, if I get home, I'll say around like um, four o'clock, if I get home around like four, ten, four thirty, I get questioned, where were you mm. after school? I have to come up with some sort of like an excuse. But again, I'm the type of person that I don't take a no for an answer, you know. Um, I'll be straight up as here, you know. Um, yeah, but uh, at that time, it was really hard. But school was a bit of a getaway for me um, because I have friends at school. And these people, I can only see them at school. If I bump into them in public, I kind of like if I'm in the public most of the time when I'm in public I'm either with the people that I was living with so I can't really like go say hi and like have a chit chat for like five or minutes you're, or you're having to get home yeah yeah, yeah. So, so that was the only case you know say school home home school so you were late getting home one day and they said right that's it caught up with a friend of mine went for a coffee before you know it the time was going quickly because the more time you spend with people you're socially engaged socially engaging and both of you are happy, blah, blah, blah. Mm. You forgot about time and you forgot about the other stuff that you're supposed to be doing until like later on you click. Which is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely it's a good thing. But in my case, it wasn't a good thing because I was like, shit, what if I get kicked out of home tonight? I had like a subconscious saying that things, those things to me. I was mm. like, chance, it's time to wrap it up. Take your shit and leave. Time to wrap it up, you know? But uh, um, eventually I had to say to, to my friend, I was like, hey, I got to go just past my Kathy, you know, I have to be at home by this time. And I'm um, talking about, I think it was around 7, 8, 8 p.m. in the middle of the night. So, um, and then that person that I was with, are like, cool, we're going to stay here, just drink coffee. And I was like, cool, I'll let you drink your coffee. I'm about to. Because they would never understand yeah, like, yeah, the yeah, pressure that you were under. I had to like kind of know, tell people what I was going through at home. And kind of like play cool just like no more other kids out there you know what i mean and you wanted to fit in at yeah. the same time and you were felt like a normal kid like them yeah. in some ways but you totally knew you weren't definitely but and like, how do you explain that to them as well because there's that cultural difference they'd be like what do you mean like there's, yeah there's no way i'm gonna explain that to them so i was just there with them like have coffee after that. i have to leave i always have to leave early you have to be the first one to leave early it's just to get home on time mm. i don't want to get questioned i don't want to be asked oh this and that and that you can't leave the house again you know but eventually my phone was on silence so i had like to about 15 missed calls so, so, you knew so, so i was like shit. In trouble. yeah excuse my language but i was like oh i'm in trouble so i went on so caught um i caught a tram you know it was just in the city and the place that our cousin living it's not too far from the city caught a tram to go home and then I call, I call one of my cousins. Was like, "Yo, what's going on? Um, I miss all these missed calls, but I'm on my way home." My cousin was like, "Oh, call, 
call the older brother, you know? I call him. He's like, okay. You have, I think he said, three choices. Either you come here, take your shit and leave. Take your stuff and leave. Or come here and never leave the house again. Stay at home. Or the third, the third one was like, oh, stay where you are. I was confused. I was like, okay. And I hang up the phone. I was like, so what do I have to do? I had to make one of the, one of the hardest choices that I've ever made in my life. You know, uh, life is a risk. You got to take the risk, you know. So I was like, look, it's either I go back and be as unhappy as I used to be. And then it get even, stuff can get even worse while I'm there. Or either just stay where I'm at. So I was like, that's it. If it's to be harmless, let it be. So I stay where I was at. And that's when it all started. So you didn't go and get your clothes? I didn't go get anything, man. Yeah, I was like on my last point. Um, Where'd you go? Didn't get no clothes. Nothing. I started wondering. I was like, where am I going to sleep, man? I started going back and forth, back and forth. But uh, it was one of the hardest things ever, man. But, uh, um, Where did you sleep that night? That night was... That night was... Uh, it, was it was a crazy night for me because I was at the last point. Where I was like, all these years I've been through this. And then... But they saw, and these people they don't see the good that I did for them. The mm. only thing that they could see is the bad, cause yeah, you done what they said for yeah, four years, yeah. and you like looked after. Yeah, them. it wasn't even four years, man. I was with them for, I would say for like over seven, six to seven months, seven years. Sorry, that's that's the period I spent with them. Like I did what well, I did a lot of the stuff that nobody could just turn around and do for anybody, but I did them for these guys. But uh, after all these years, they just decided for me saying that I'm gonna stay out and just have a cup of coffee with, with a friend of mine. They just decided to keep throwing me out. Like you meant nothing. To yeah, them. yeah. Like, like, yeah. I'm nothing, you know. And then for something for, that's not doing anything wrong, yeah. just having a coffee. Yeah. So from that day, I just start talking to myself. And from from that period of time when I you hang up the phone, press the stop button on the tram, stopped. Get out. I got out. I was like, I start hearing my seven hair. I was like, what am I doing? Who am I? You know, I don't have anyone here. And you've been but, through so much just yeah. to get to this point where you were lost and alone and yeah, yeah, so it's confusing it's in it. this country that you thought was going to be a paradise. Yeah, I start going back and forth. So I would walk this direction, walk this direction, come back in the middle, stop and try to think, and then walk back this and walk back that direction, and then come back in the middle. So I caught a bus from the city just at uh, uh, King William Street to down at um, Playerthor. That's where one of my friends was living. And then I tried to call him. He wasn't answering because he was at work at the time. I was like, I'm at my last point, man. I just want to go. You know, I want to take my life away. I want to be gone, you know. I don't want to be seen again. I was about to submit it. I walk in the middle of the road. That road, it's, it's a road that I look at all the time and I just could see myself I was standing in there crazy amount of cars stopping and beeping and just out of nowhere that stranger that stopped the car and walk outside their car and pull my hand out of that road saved my life and then I slept at the bus stop I was at the bus stop for a long time I only had two stuff which is my school uniform and then I had my work uniform where I was working we had to wear work uniforms here I could kind of try and manage to go to work and stay in between the two stuff that I was, the two clothes that I had. And then I went and sleep on my friends. Um, They had um a little uh, shed in the backyard. So I said, yo, can you let me crash here for a bit? I don't have anywhere else to go. When you walked into the road, do you think you really wanted to die or you're just in so much pain you couldn't handle it at that moment? I was in so much pain. That I've been disconnected from our family for so many years. The people that said they were gonna they put their hand up to look after me when I get here, they decided to put their hand down. I had nowhere to go. I had no one that I could turn to and say, man, I'm going through these obstacles and I can't find a way to overcome them. And I did not understand the system as well. I had teachers, I had family, friends, and but none of them, I wasn't thinking straight because 
I was going through on my la I was on my last point. So overwhelmed. Yeah, I was overwhelmed with everything that was going on and I was on my last point, man. If I'm saying last points is like, I just want to go. Because what's the point? Why am I going to be standing here or try to fuck my way out of this if I don't have a biological family here that can look out for me? If I don't have a biological family that I can turn around to and say, this is what I'm going through, and they'll be like, we care. You know? Because no so, one can do it alone, yeah. and you felt like, well, I, I'm destined to be alone. That's it, that's it. And I was like, this is not, this is not right. It's it. So that's why I was like, I was at my last point, I was about to submit. And this is my life story, man. I was, I was about to submit. I was in that road, I wanted to get hit by a car. If I had a car, Probably I could have drive into a tree or a pole just to take my life away. I had nothing to lose. That's what I saw within myself. What do I have to lose, you know? I'm going back and forth within my own emotions, fighting my own demons, and I felt like I was giving up, you know? I was and going around and around in circles because yeah. you'd spent your whole young life waiting for things to get better. Yeah, that's And yeah. going through so much, always thinking it was going to get better, but it just... It didn't it didn't get any better so just keep repeating the same cycle how do you feel the next morning when you woke up the next morning when i woke up i was i still wasn't thinking because it's like it's it's a whole cycle when you've been traumatized it's something that it lives within until when you decided to like let go of a lot of stuff and um find a peace within yourself so i was still feeling anxious about everything what if i bumped into them in public what am i gonna say you know because it's all about respecting your elders and these people are older than i am so in our culture you know so i had to respect them regardless of what happened so i was like what if i bump into them in public what am i gonna say to them you know what i'm saying and you're so, such so, a so. respectful great person that you're still worrying about how they might feel if you bump into them yeah and you're the one that's been kicked out of kicked out of home and left to your own devices yeah yeah so and you're still worried about what other people might think or feel yeah that's 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 literally what i was i was thinking to myself or like if i was to bump into um family or uh, like uh, family friends for example because uh a congolese community is a really small community in australia so everyone knows each other so they would ask and you about it and then they would yeah, go back and tell like, your family definitely and then um and then the people that I was living with, they're well known in the community as well. So if anything was to go wrong, if I was to bump into someone who asked me, how are these people doing? I don't know what I'm going to say. The one thing that I don't want to do is lie to somebody and say, they're doing really fine, even though I haven't seen them for mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. The next day when I wake up, the first thing first I did in the morning, put credit in my phone and I call my cousin, the one that said, I don't want to see you here again call him said i'm calling to check in i want to come and collect my stuff if you guys don't want to have me there anymore you know what he said to me i don't want to hear from you again do never want to cross the gates of my house again and what did i have to do you know i had to stay back i had nothing you know i had nothing i only had i had my l's at that time that's it and and it was just me and myself, no identification, no documents, nothing. Yeah, so that's that's how that's how I felt like. And ever since that was my last phone call. No, that was my second to last phone call that I had with him. And then I had to go back to their house to try and find as many as much documents that I could find to try and help myself out to get out of this situation that I was in, you know. So I went back over there. I went to one at home. So I took some of the stuff that I took, but some of the documents that were in my room was already been taken away from my room. So I couldn't do nothing. So I ended up leaving the house. I took a couple of clothes, but I didn't notice that I took some clothes. See, so he went to my work where I was working. Took because he used to hold my bank card as well. So I took my bank card to work, and then it was like to them, it's chance working here today. They say yes. But like if he's working, give him the card. And then I went to work. My work mate was like, your brother was here. And he looked really frustrated and really pissed off. Did you do something wrong? Are you in trouble? I said, nah, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm all good. Yeah, oh, well, he left your card here. He said, you can have it. And I was like, oh, thank you. And I got a phone call back for me. That was the last phone call. It's like, I know you came to the house. 
and if you anything is missing in the house, I'm gonna report it stolen, and then I'm gonna get you in trouble with the police. So these are my own, these are my first cousin, like first cousin, someone that I call a brother to me. I looked up to him as a father figure, you know. Um, so I was like, okay, cool. It is what it is, you know. So I was like, oh well, what do you want me to say? You ever call me? You already okay? You call me. I went to your place. I was looking for some documents because obviously I have nothing, you know. If I was to seek for help, who's gonna help me out with nothing? And you know how the Australian system works like. You need to either have your documents that prove that you're an Australian citizen or you have your documents that prove that you can stay in Australia for them to help you out. And if you don't have a passport, you don't have nothing, then you're just another person on the street. You have nothing. You have nothing to nothing to really hold on to, nobody that you can go to and they can help you out because it's part of the whole system. I took a deep breath in, I was like, this just killed my whole vibe, I was at work, you know, I'm usually one of the happiest people when I'm working with people, I try to be uh, in a positive mindset as I can possibly be, and, but I still ain't nobody noticed that I was going through the hardest part of my life, so one of the work is that um, I used to really get along with a lot, and he, he, he noticed something, he was like, Chance, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm good, he was like, yeah, that's only because... You're like usually very energetic and out there like ch chatting to people, customers, but now nah, it seems like something is off. Maybe s someone pissed you off at work. I was like, nah, man, I'm all good. Because I didn't want to share no nothing, none of my struggles, what I was going through. I wanted to keep that within myself. Why was that? Were you afraid of what would happen if you said something? I was afraid. Of this. I didn't want anyone to know. And also, I do not understand the Australian system. You know, the last time I tried to be a bit open to one of my teachers, they end up like sharing the information to my cousin. And you you know? see that that but got I, you in trouble. But, so. Yeah, but again, that wasn't the case at that time. At that time, I was just like, this is my fight. You know, I don't want to come to you, someone else at work and talk to them about my personal problems so they can feel bad for me. I don't want them to feel bad for me. So that was pride. Yeah. So I was like, it's it's what I did. I decided I took the decisions to stay where I was at. And it it is what it is, you know, because it's, it's consequences. You know, we have to face our consequences sometimes. So that's what happened. But eventually they end up finding out that I was harmless because I was working two days a week. Uh, and most of the money that I was working for, I was trying to, do the best. I didn't know about anything about housing, how to apply for a house or how to seek support because I was still new into the Australian system or how to seek support to some sort of like organizations. Mm. And then when I was going through schooling, I started realizing, I was like, look, I'm still living on my friend's backyard. Um, and also I was living between there and the street. So I was between his backyard and the street and living in there, it's literally worse than being on the street because I'm sleeping in a place where it was full of rats and and like it was full of holes and it was in the winter, you know, during the winter period, you just get frozen in there. But um, And then when you're on the street, you're sleeping at parks and yeah, on, on benches and yeah. stuff. But again, I was grateful to how it felt. To felt like I had like a short, like um, a roof under my head. You know what I mean? Even um, though it was full of rats and freezing cold. Yeah, yeah. It like was a, a place you could come back to. Other rubbish because they use it as a storage and had like a lot of other stuff. But you got to be thinking, like, how is this but, my life? Yeah. Well, especially you, you work a job, you, you've put in so much effort. You've been this good person. You come so far, and yet that's yeah. where you're at. Yeah. And then again, I start, I start realizing and thinking to myself, where am I standing? Where am I heading? You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm here today. Tomorrow, something could happen to me. Um, but again, I was paying $100 per night when I was there, you know? No, not per night, per week, mm. per week when I was there. Mm. Uh, because I, if I felt really bad to stay at someone's place, shower, sometime I'll shower, they shower, sometime I'll go shower at the gym. <sighs> But Just there was no room for you in the so actual house? There was no room. The house was very crowded. Mm. This is, I think, two bedroom, and it had like to about six or seven people in there. So you can imagine the shower was little. So, um, yeah, so, so it's like, it was difficult there and out as well. So I just thought, I think it would be best for me to just stay out. What made you keep so going through school? Because of, um, so like, 
so when I was going through what I was going through, th um, what happened was I got in touch. I started looking on Facebook because I wasn't really communicating with my biological family back in the Congo. So I was looking on Facebook trying to get connected to them because I knew if I was connected to them, that could lift up my spirit. Because mm. the most um, useful and kind words that you hear from your family members that will usually boost up your energy and your spirit to being a different person. I was searching on social media's internet to try and find a sibling, somebody that was connected to me. If it was my siblings or my cousins, whatever, back at home, you know. That's why how I went with things. I was looking, searching, searching, spend hours while I was at school searching, you know. And then eventually I ended up finding a brother, a brother on, on Facebook. And then he connected me to mom and then connected me to dad and the whole family. And then um, still I was still going to school because school was like some sort of like ther therapy for me, you know, a, ther a therapeutic place for me where I could go to a full self. Because you had some structure. And, yeah, and engage with like, the rest of the students and a few of my friends as well. Therefore, I can feel connected and I can feel part of something and be part of something you know mm. so um what did your okay. parents say the first time you were able to contact them um so they didn't know so much about what was going on um but uh i told them that, so the people that i was living with already called them i think and they told them that i decided to leave the house you know so they put all the blames on me that oh this guy decided to just take off he's getting too hard-headed and mm. they can't do stuff or do with stuff that we're doing at the house with all stuff that we have in the house so so he's left the house you know and i told him look that's not how it happened this is how it happened dad wasn't happy uh, i remember the last word to say if anything was to happen to you there this person that did that to you the family as well will, will go through the same pain that we're gonna have to go through as a family so you felt those, very protective. Yeah, th those are the words from dad, you know, and hearing such a thing, it made me feel like I had people there for me. Because someone people cared about cared you. cared about me, you know. The only yeah. people in the world that actually loved yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, uh, so it was, it was the family, man. It was, it was, they're the ones that helped me out, say. We weren't there together through my journey, but again, I said to myself, family is always a family, you know. Uh, you can go through whatever route you want to go through. You can grow in a different world, but uh, there's one thing. You always get connected. It's like branches of trees, man. You know, branches grows. They grow, they spread all over the place. But at the end of the day, what they're connected on, they're connected to one tree. And that's, that's the mindset that I had. But again, my family didn't motivate me to keep going to school. Oh, nobody motivated me. But I looked at my life situation and the condition I was in. I was working and I know I give 10% of my earning to homeless people. You see me walk around the street or around the city handing stuff to people because that's just who I am. I believe in giving. You give without expecting anything. Eventually you're going to get something back. You know, that, that's what I've been living for. That's but what you I were doing, doing that when you had yeah. nothing yourself. Yeah. Still, right? When I was going through my homelessness, I was still doing that. I remember the one one time this person that I saw was crying, I don't have a place to stay. I haven't had nothing, no food, nothing. I was like, let's go. I'll take you out for lunch, let's go have lunch together. There was a harmless person. We sat down, we ate together, and I said, look, I have $100. Use this to help you out. Get a blanket or something, you know? And again, it's just like bits and pieces. I wasn't expecting nothing, and still I don't. I still do it until today. So I looked at where I was standing, and uh, since I was still going to school, but I wasn't really focusing on my studies. I, yeah. ca I called to about 50 homeless uh, organizations here in South Australia to help me out. You know what they all did? The first thing, do you have an Australian citizenship? No. Do you have a copy of your passport? No. A visa? No. And you knew that down. would be, you knew that's yeah. what would happen. Yeah, all the organization I ever called, they keep turning me down. And I said, I'm not going to give it up from here. You know, I was still studying at the time, still going through my high school journey. I will leave the school early. Sometimes I don't show up at school. I'll just show up to the school, do a bit, bit minimum of school. 
and go out about into the community, start doing door knocking to organization, try to see if I can find someone to help yeah, me. Yeah, because you're desperate to yeah, survive. I needed to find a place, a suitable place for me. And then and there must be a, a lot of people in situations like that where they don't have that documentation maybe they come from a similar situation and then yeah. they can't get through the red tape to actually get the help definitely there is a lot of them a lot of people out there and hey look i was one of them as i'm saying this to you i used to use the reason why i used to go to school all the time at first was because of the computer and the internet i needed to use that to try and get myself to try to kind of get the help that I kind of needed after a little while when I realized that I really need to get out of this situation. So it's calling, calling organization after organization and some people aren't responding, some people respond and say, oh, we're going to get back to you. You know, it has been, um, I'll say eight years now since I've come out of those situations. Still have the same phone number. None of those people ever call me back. They just, they were giving me hope, you know? Oh, sorry, they, they'll, they'll say, oh, share a bit about yourself. I'll share a bit of my story. They'll be like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry to hear you went, you had to go through that. But what am I getting from them? I wasn't getting nothing. Start knocking, door knocking places. I rock up to places out of nowhere, man. Until when I bump into a place, it's called hype housing. Those people help me out, man. They found a place for me, even though the first place that I ever had to sleep in was worse than jail, you know? how the system is like here you know they treat harmless people as people that ain't worth it people that ain't valid i was sleeping at this place paying ten dollars per night and it was like a jail you know um it was just like a little room no mattress nothing you know those showers which was great but again there was no difference between being in there or being in jail so what were you sleeping on then i was sleeping on this little uh flat mat and it was freezing in there, no blankets or anything, you know. I didn't have no blankets. They didn't provide no blankets because they say you provide, you come up, you come with your own stuff. And this place I'm talking about, it's in the center of the city of South Australia. So, so it was like really hard at the time. Yeah, but did they want to help you? Or they, they didn't. Not, none of them ever approached me and said, "Chance, how you feeling? I heard you going through this." all this before we go to refer for you to come here and stay here for a bit none of them ever try to help me out but again at that time i think it was because i still had a social worker from hype hype housing and um that social worker she i said to her look i don't have documentation the only thing that i have with me is this my driver's license a copy of my driver's license which is and then she was like, that's all right, that's enough. It's not enough, but I'll do what I can to try and get you the help that you need. The social worker was busting her ass up. She was going back and forth to try and, like, find a better place because I was still studying, you know. I'm talking about coming to the final years of my studies now. I was, I was in, 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 in year 12, you know, so I had to, like, give it all, you know. I said to myself, I want to finish here. After this, I want to go into university. I give it all like I invested my energy and everything into my schooling I would go whatever places so after school I go find a place to stay and after that I'll go back to school or go to the library study and study until when I can be able to like get my papers what was your you mindset know? my mindset at the time when I was studying I just want to get it done you know because throughout my schooling journey I've achieved some of um the highest academic reward in, in my schooling and the people that I was living with at the time I invite them to come there to celebrate with me because those other students in the same room that had their own parents or like caregivers or carers social workers coming in there you know when they when they're like achieving something you know it might not be something big but it's small but again to have someone there to celebrate that with you yeah it's most means people, a lot just about yeah, everyone i invite these people said i give them a letter this is a letter a letter of invitation to the assembly at this time and that time i have um this thing on because uh, i was given a reward for achieving i think up to like four three or four a's within the um some of my subjects and it's just, just incredible yeah. considering everything that was going on around you to yeah. still be able to focus like that uh, thank you yeah so i invited them but uh, none of them ever showed up and then the, the, the time i'm just taking you back you know by the time when i went back home or did you invite us to this place to these things 
were like you clearly knew that thing was at this time that time i say i couldn't make it we so i'm sorry about that and bits and pieces that are bit and pieces like that matters it matters to everyone regardless who you are all those stuff matters if somebody is putting their hands up to support you that matters as well as well as, as well as showing up to you, you remember it yeah so those things are there the things that really motivated me because they said by the time you leave this house you're not gonna leave you're gonna die you're gonna be dead it has been eight years i'm still standing yeah so i managed to finish high school went to uni to do um health sciences did that and um and now i'm here you know yeah so i wanted to get into medicine into into medicine into like um becoming a doctor and helping other people and support people but hey the university changed my mindset and also um my experience as well and my working ethic too yeah i've worked in a lot of a lot of field i worked um i've done farming i've done a uh, mechanics i've done i've done like a lot of stuff to be where i'm at today and sending a lot of money back to your back family to the and the family because well. i have to i have to support my family i have to they had the one day for them you know during wars they lost everything they ever had a lot of them are traumatized you know a lot of them um plus dad mom even though i still have that strong heart of like encouraging us to keep working hard but they they have trauma you know they've been traumatized and they do not understand how to deal with that i have to kind of like bust my ass or my ass hard over here to provide money for schooling for my siblings and also provide money for food and a few other stuff tried send money in there for businesses they try stuff stuff failed you know i think what's remarkable about I this think. is you were barely able to survive yourself when you only had yourself to rely on and with the money that you did make then you still had to or you chose to send that back home to your family who were struggling in their own way and then even giving money out to people who were homeless as well so even when you were on your last dollar and your life was in danger you were still under that pressure or felt that need to help other people and put them first too and it says a lot about the person you are yeah yeah no, thank you yeah um yeah again i tried i tried my best as well. i tried my best because if i don't do it who else is gonna do it you know um basically the way the mindset that people have over there is like australia where people leave there's always money because that's how the world that's how the media portray australia you know they portray the western world it's like there's money there's money everywhere but i'll reassure you life is a lot more better there mentally speaking because over there there's stress and all this sort of stuff, but there's a community. There's a unity around. There's people that you can talk to and they're not gonna charge you a penny. Mm. They will give you advi free advice. And that's what we use a lot of like the older people for over there. Mm. They're wise and they there's, are always- so There's that connection and yeah. you feel supported and like you matter. Yeah, unlike here, but that's what I try to help them to understand. You don't print money off tree here, you know. If I send you guys hundred dollars or two hundred dollars today, tomorrow you should be appreciative. You made it. that money, and that's yeah. not easy to do. Yeah, try to use that money for the goods and try to invest the money. You can turn two hundred dollars for three hundred dollars or four hundred dollars if you use it smart. Then that's what I told. That's what I told them. But again, my life experience is what made me do what I do. My life experience was what was encouraging me to give. Because the more you give without expecting anything, the more you get stuff back. And it's those life experiences that made you realize that you needed to take your career in a different direction. And I know you got into mentoring people and trying to use your story and what you've been through and the spirit that you've developed to try to help others. Like, how did that all come about? And Yeah, um, yeah so that came about within, so when I was at uni, I started doing a bit of like, so I had a mentor at first when I was, uh, when I got a house that I was living at. So I, I became a mentee uh, through St. John's and uh, I had um, I had a mentor and a social worker as well. And this person was one of the best mentors that I ever had. It was one of the best people that I ever had in my life um, because this person helped me out through a lot. So while I was going through school and just helping with the transitions into finding a place, a suitable place, uh, organization that could take me on board 
and on top of that I was saying to I had a teacher as well at school that um knew a bit about my harmlessness and this teacher cooked pumpkin soup and offered that pumpkin soup to me and my friend that was going through the same thing that was going through the person that was helping me out to stay in the backyard so that that pumpkin soup it's like a magical thing for me you know it's something that remind me of who I was and and uh, how incredible that people can be that are not even connected to you by blood you know so um, that was an example of a time that someone showed they cared yeah 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 yes yeah. so that was that was a good example that was but there was so little of that that those times stood out to you yeah no nah, definitely those stuff actually stood out to me until today that teacher i'm still in contact with them but i start when i went to uni i became a man so i was still a mentee while i was a mentor so i was mentoring young aboriginal kids through our high school and try to connect them to university programs therefore they can pursue higher educations and um the how are you helping them the, um by doing tutoring say so we'll go to schools and i uh, offer my time out to like do tutoring so yeah um so helping them helping them actually academically yeah academically speaking yeah because the whole goal is to uh, contribute toward closing the gap in education mm. so i uh, would like go to schools so after my uni courses go to schools one after school homework sessions and also a bit of mentoring sessions as well and have a bit of a chat around their life where they're standing what they need help with and then from there i end up moving on to um and then for so i was still doing, doing that for a little while there's some school that we used to go to until like what well, 9 p.m in the night you know uh, there's some boarding school that we're going to until like 9 p.m in the night running sessions there but again I connected so much with this, these people that I was working with and I could see myself within some of the people that I was working with, my little, mm. my, my younger self, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But I, and also on top of that, I'm like, look, I didn't have none of this stuff. Giving back to the community should not be an issue. You know, I could have been out there within those time that I was spending giving back to the community, making money or working a job and make more money to help me out, may help my family out, but I chose to go back and give to the community and work with people because that's how I was gonna understand who I was as a as, as a person that has been away from my family for a long period of time. What did you learn from doing that work? I learned a lot about myself, serious from the day when I actually um I was like taken out of that road. The next day I start taking journals. So start taking journal by paper. And then after that when I had a phone I start to, I start setting up journals um through paper of every stuff that I was doing. What did I learn today? You know? Um so that, you're doing that every day? Yeah, yeah. Keeping yeah. So note of everything of that like happened. Everything that has happened and on top of that, not not just like everything or whole day, but some of the most important stuff, some of the problem, how did I solve this problem throughout the day, you know? So I kept on doing that. And then when I was working with these kids as well, I was doing exactly the same thing. I wasn't mentioning their names in there, but I was like mentioning some of the problem that we solved together as a team. So me and the young person in our that I was working with, some of them now they're like, oh man, and we bumped into each other in public. Oh, Chance, what's up? I said, what's up? And like- They I, remember you. Yeah, yeah, they remember me because I wasn't just there just for the sake of turning up and show people that I want to do a lot more to help out the community. But I was there as a as a somebody that played a role as a either a brother or like a, a friend, you know, like a good friend that will listen to you and try to help you out so we can work together to come up with. Uh, what do they say to you about what stuff. you did for their lives? So today, um, so before I actually go into that, see some of these young fellas that I worked with, I used to mentor at the time as well. This was like when I stopped being a mentee. Say some of these people that I was working with as um as a mentor some of them end up going into uni and doing other stuff at university but again i have to reassure them you don't have to go to university to get your stuff done some people university might not be for you or like studying further might not be for you you can look into different pathways and help them out through that and a lot of time a lot of these young people they'll come to me and say chance thank you some of them are like whoa six foot way taller than i am but again they still that mutual respect over there why because i never looked down on them as in like someone that never knew how to write their name or as somebody that um never knew who they were i just look and up that to would them stand out to like, them because yeah. so many people in their lives would look at them that way and would yeah. make them feel like nothing the way that you felt yeah definitely but it just takes one person to make you believe in yourself or see that there is hope yeah. for you 
Nah, you're right, and that's that's it, and that's the whole case, man. Um, yeah, and that's how I think I got connected with a lot of them because I don't judge people. I try to live my life without judging anybody because I say don't judge anybody just in case you get judged too. Well, and you or, don't know what, they, what they've yeah. been through. Yeah, and don't sue anybody just to advance your causes, you know. Try to do the best, the bare minimum, the best you can be. Give it, give it, your be give it your best. You know what I mean? And that's what I was doing throughout the, throughout my mentoring journey. And then from there, I won a few award through the organization I was working for to um, as one of the best mentors, which gave us the opportunity to travel from point B to point to point A to point B to go and start off a mentoring program to a different place. So we went there, started off another program, a mentoring program that kicked off you know and then came back over here i was still doing some volunteering work too so so was it apparent to you that mentoring was the thing for you and you wanted more of that in your life in terms of like, where you want to go work wise or you want to definitely incorporate that because it would give you that feeling of you know you're doing so much for other people yeah at that time not really at that time i just saw it as in like something giving I'm giving, right? And also on top of that, I'm learning myself because I didn't know sh stuff about mentoring. Just the word mentor itself, a lot of people think it means you have to be, it's a crazy word, you know, you have to be very crazy to be able to have a mentor, which is not. And a lot of my other friends had that mindset too, where they'll call you a mentor, they'll call you crazy, like, um, and then, so through doing a bit of mentoring and going around and working with different people and see how people engage and how they interact like i'm learning so much i have still had my own personal problems that i was battling myself but just speaking to people and hearing their stories and sharing a bit of my story with them it's a healing session for me you know it's not just me mentoring a mentee i'm learning so much from their mentee as well as they're learning so much from myself as well and writing it all down yeah that's it and taking key notes down as well i encourage them to take journals as well you never know what you, you can turn your channel into, you know what I'm saying? So just keep going, keep going. So they were like, okay, cool, we're gonna offer you this position. So they've already like closed all their applications and I didn't have no qualification at that time. I only had, uh, I think it was a certificate for in business. You know, I was still studying and then there's like, oh, we have a position available as a program manager for the program. I was like, I can't take it because I don't think I can do it. Um, well, I don't have the qualification for it. I don't have this. I don't have that. The application it was like there was a guy that came from Sydney down to do interviews, and the guy was like, the in the application is closed, but I'm gonna ask them to reopen it for you. And this person was the first person that um, I would say ever believed in me more than how much I believed in myself at first. You know, he said, I'm going to get you in this. You're going to get in there. You're going to nail it. You're going to do really well because I already see the type of person you are. That's when the door was open for me, you know. What did that mean to you? Say, so, um, at first, really, I wasn't looking at the position. It's because I don't really value positions. Positions are not really so important for me. What matters for me is what you do. What impact are you, are you making from that all? Who are you influence? Who are you influencing? Are you influencing them positively or negatively? You know, and I try to choose the positive side of things. And if it was negative, I'ma tell you some stuff that are true for by yourself. That you're gonna go think about it. At the end of the day, you can choose to cut me off or keep me keep me around. But at the end of the day, it's up to you. So, but the position you end up so in good. is gonna influence how much impact you can have. That's it. Yeah. So I felt I felt really um, anxious about it. But the guy said, "Look, you can do a chance." You can do it. I believe in you. Through what you've been through, you can still do this. I said, cool. I'll, I'm going to take, take your word for it. Spend some time with him. We spent like hours doing interviews and uh, photo shoots and uh, stuff. And then I was given a book, like a massive book. It's called The Mentor, you know. I was reading that book, read the book, and then wrote up a whole summary and send it through to them because that was one of the job requirements, you know. You read this mentoring book that they wrote. And then send them um write up um I think it was a like two thousand words they say and, and send the food to them, and then I think they're gonna make they're gonna they were gonna decide based on that and also the interview if you were suitable. Um, eventually they end up offering me the job, start working as a program manager who was throughout um here and was traveling Australia helping out other people. Wow. And then um, 
thought our organization stopped working for them so i moved on to unisa so start off another mentoring program for unisa so my position was given to one of the kids that i used to mentor uh, in the cool. group so i um, moved into unisa and um start doing a bit of uh, again the same thing so you're I was doing. a mentoring program manager at unisa yes and i was working really good and i was like look i can start my own organization based on like mentoring and inspiring people to get up on and speak up their dreams and try to like chase whatever that they can they can chase in life to get to where they want to be because this is so, your gift you can offer the yeah, world now yeah so i've already left uni sales i've already completed my first bachelor which is bachelor of health sciences um so i finished that and then i was like this is not my life i don't want to do this i want to help our people because i've been here and i want to give back i want there's a lot of more people that are like me out there or worse than that are going through worse things that i've been through out there you know but they don't know, know how to seek not that, that many <laughs> yeah so i was like but you're you've shown yourself that you can yeah. have this impact and you can help people uh, in, a, in a unique way and that didn't relate to necessarily what you'd studied that's it yeah so i was like cool i'm gonna take a different studies i think this is like four man. but i was like i'm gonna pursue it different studies as well so i started doing um psychological sciences which is like um advanced, advanced psychology in child and youth counseling so i started that for for some times and then and then i finished the course and then again like depression kicked in again i I became super depressed to the point that I was like, who am I? Where am I standing? What triggered that? Just the way I was living my life, the people that were surrounding me. I still had like all the same old friends that I used to have in high school. And um, and like I was still lost because financially I wasn't heading anywhere. Mentally I wasn't heading anywhere. Uh, I had a house which I was paying rent for. And I had friends that I was living with in the house. And I start asking myself, who am I? Where where am I heading? Like, I don't have a, I don't have vision, no dreams, nothing. But you didn't I feel didn't, like you had direction. Yeah, 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 I didn't feel like I had any directions or where I was going. So when was this? This was um. Talking around twenty, the end of twenty eighteen, the starting of twenty nineteen, because I was planning to go back home to visit my 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 mom and my siblings and stuff in twenty twenty nineteen. And I kicked in again. So I had nowhere to go. So, I mean, I had a place to stay in, but I, again, I became emotionally homeless. Mm. Because of that, I felt like I couldn't relate or connect it to anybody. So I lay back, took some time off for myself. I was like, I'm going to spend a whole year within my room. I spent one year in the room, man. Um, the only thing that was in there, the only thing I could see was darkness. It was me, just myself, nobody else. And those housemates, they'll come knock on my door, your chance, you're okay. They're all worried for my, for me and my mentor. I was like, I'm good. I'm gonna hold in here as long as I can. And I had friends that would come knock on the door, ask, let's go out to get something to eat. I said, no, I'm not at home, even though I was at home. Stayed in that room to find myself. Uh, I think I was some, someone different, you know. I didn't know who I was, so I spent a whole year in there. I was like, I'm going to find myself. Until the day I find my inner self, I said, I'm coming out of this room. No work, nothing. I stopped doing everything. So I had some savings in there, and then I started getting a bit of centering when my savings went off. And I was surviving on my center line. Yeah. But putting yourself and, in darkness like yeah. that, not going out, not it, engaging, did that make it all worse? It didn't make it. It didn't make it worse because for me, but for some people could be because the reason why I said it didn't make it worse for myself was because I wasn't just sitting in there doing nothing. I was reading, spending my time reading all these psychological books and going through my life journals and going through a lot of stuff and um, doing a bit of research and oh, so you and were trying to, understand trying to understand what had happened to you how to how it yeah. affected you and then how yeah, it was yeah. playing out now that's it so basically it was in there I was in there by myself it was a back room you know you're thinking you're thinking loudly like there's no one that you can see as you just imagine finding yourself in a dark room right now by yourself how would you feel like you know you're gonna think about survival mode right you're gonna think about how am I gonna survive this room it's dark, so dark in here I want a light I want to get out of this and that's how that was the whole um a knowledge that i use in order for me to find my inner self 
Why didn't you go to therapy or get someone to help you? Because I believe that therapy therapy doesn't really work. Why do you think that? I think that because I've been to few counseling sessions, I've been through thirty few um therapy sessions. I even had like a lot of mentors in the past. When I, I put my life together and I was working, I was spending to about three thousand dollars per mentor a month. Mm. And what was I getting from it? I wasn't getting nothing okay, from it. So they didn't work for you they the ones you went to? They, nah, so they didn't really understand who I am, who I was, or they didn't want to spend the time to understand who I was. But again, I wanted to invest within myself because I'm investing in people. What am I doing for myself, you know? I wanted to work. So you were depressed only. and staying in that room, but you wanted to be better. You wanted want, life yeah, to be better. You weren't giving it. up. Yeah, I wasn't giving up. I wanted to become, I want to come out of that room reborn again. That's the word I'm use, being born again. So I want to come out of that room as a different person. I want to forget about the struggles that I went through and use that to get to where, where, where I want to be in the future. And I want to use that to inspire other people to speak up their dreams and to, to like get, get up on their butt and just, just see themselves and say, it's okay to spend time by yourself. Because when I was going through harmlessness, I needed to spend so much time with people to feel normal. I needed to spend as much time as I can there for I don't have to think about what I was going through. And then spending time by myself in the dark room. No distractions. Was, no distractions was a way for me to find myself. Was a way for me to spend at least some time with myself and said, look, this is who I am and I'm going to accept it. If anybody else chose to accept it or not, it is what it is, but I have to accept myself first, be at peace within myself in order for me to be out there. Um, I recall the last day that I was that I came out of that room, I called. I didn't call, I drove my car. I woke up on my cousin's house out of nowhere. I've already overcome all the, I've conquered all this stuff that I went through. I've conquered all my enemies, my fears of um, not standing up for myself and not thinking straight. I said, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to apologize to them if I was wrong. It's that day, that day changed my life, man. I walked into the house and knocked. I said, look, I'm here to talk to you guys. If I was in the wrong, I want to say I'm sorry apologizing i just want things to be okay i want to live my life no more peace within myself and i don't want to be worrying about nobody i don't want nobody to worry about me i'm here to apologize for what i did but you know what I keep going around the circle when i was apologizing i keep going around the circle through the conversation but again i've done what i was supposed to do i took that out of my chest so i moved on at the end of the day said oh well you know you're welcome if you want to come back I said thank you but i moved on i start to have, um try to kind of keep that relationship to maintain that relationship that i had with them by going back revisit the kids as well my nephews and also my cousin and spend some time there but again a comment was made which i wasn't happy with and i said look in my life i don't think i need this kind of negativity so i need to move on so I decided to just like focus on myself from that day. By the start of 2020, I was a different person. I started volunteering for DCP, Department of Child Protection, and I was doing transportation, taking kids that have been moved away from home to like schools, pick them up from school, take them to access, and like doing a bit in pieces just to help out. Um, and again, I wasn't getting paid for that, and I wasn't working. I was still living on my Centrelink. And then uh, this lady, um, she, she, she just offered me a job. She said, Chance, there's a job. I want you to start at this date. So like, cool. So I became a business support officer at, uh, DCP, you know, Department of Child Protection. And I was doing that for a bit. Again, I still had my other stuff over there. And also while I was in that room for that year, I already done, um, I did another a bit of a study while I was doing my Bachelor of Psychological Sciences and also uh, Challenge Youth Counseling. I did a smash a whole diploma within, within like well, a month, two month time when I was in there because I wanted to learn more. I was so hungry for it. I wanted to get out there and inspire as many people as I can after that. And then after, the, after everything that I went through, got into the community, started volunteering, helping our kids and 
and like that i felt so good about it i was like this is amazing you know um all my life i've been working with kids and i love what i do you know um and then from there i started applying for a few jobs so first i start working as a child psychologist child counselor like helping our kids and the kids that have been moved from home and like would like save regulations and da 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 and didn't like that say so i wanted to spend more time with kids i started looking into youth work hmm. yes yeah, so i started looking into youth work and then i went on board and started doing a bit of youth work and um so i was uh, so, so since then i've been doing a lot of youth work and there's a lot of people that struggled um with life and a lot of stuff that get thrown at them a lot of young people that have been traumatized in the past and some organization they either re-traumatize the kid because you have workers who do not understand their needs and what they've been through so I spend most of my times to work as a, a youth worker to try and like help out the community again and all those notes you took you turned it into a book that's it the inspiration behind that was was this way i went back and i uh, started looking for help you know i started I start searching for jobs i was looking for jobs e everywhere right but i couldn't i found most jobs uh, there's a time when i apply for jobs and i go like to about five to seven interviews I attend all the interviews but i got all the jobs and most of these jobs were the high paying jobs I'm talking about 100 to 150 thousand dollars a year it's either i could have chose to go for the money or um just go become a youth worker but uh i pull my heart out there say i'm gonna be a youth worker because i think a lot of these kids need that support i didn't have that and i think the greatest support you can ever have as a child is emotional support is somebody that is there to help you out no judge you. you can talk to them when you're angry or upset and they can come to you at any time a lot of kids that i work with they're the kids that actually helped me out to go through what I went through because they're special in so many different ways. Regardless who they are, they're special. And other people that go through whatever stuff that they go through, harmlessness, mental health, these people are special. They help other people to stand up on their feet, you know? And I never wanted to be just a tool. I never wanted to just be one of those people that sit in chair and talk to someone about a problem i want to make as fun as, as it's supposed to be i want us to like play go out play soccer and through that somebody's gonna come and open up to you and say i'm going through this i don't know what to do i'm lost and that's just the strategies that are kind of like implement at work i'm not hired as a psychologist or a child psychologist or as a but i'm hired as a support worker a youth support worker meaning that that mentoring role plays in as well so a lot of time that I spend with kids, go out with them, play with them, I'm learning myself. I'm learning a lot about myself. I'm learning a lot about those kids. When I ever feel down about myself, when I go to work, that boosts up my energy. Because it's little kids there. They're just kids regardless of what they do. They smash TVs, they smash walls. At the end of the day, if you have a good understanding of the trauma, or your past trauma, if you've been through one. You can have compassion for them. You can have compassion for them. And yeah, and if you're not there, then who's going to be? That's it. And that's how I went about with it. And then as I go as well, I don't write kids' name in there, but I wrote the journal about myself. What did I learn for today? Some of my life experiences cha changed me, and the year that I spent in that room by myself, I came out as a different person. I didn't care about what people have to think about me no more, you know? And it was always about me. And what if I died today? What, what have I done, you know? So what's in this book that you've written? Uh, the book that I've written, it's called For the Mentors and Mentees. So myself was a mentee and I didn't really have the mentors that I, I could have called mentors. So I used to pay for sessions, attending mentoring online to people that are like in USA, so I'm here that I used to meet up in person. But again, these people never really understood who I was and they were never really passionate about about hearing my story or tried to help me out with my goals. So um, I went on, tried a bunch of different mentors and uh, again, I'm paying for these mentors. And some people volunteered to mentor me. 
But again, I said there was a lot of stuff that was missing. If you're a mentor or you have a mentor and your mentor doesn't reach out to you to say, hey, how's it going? How's things? Where are you standing at the moment? They're not considered as mentors, right? I, I think that's what they're supposed to be doing. They're supposed to check up on no, you. No, they don't really care about you. It's just about you. Yeah. What you get, what you pay for. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Basically, that was it. That was it, you know? Like, um, it was that. They don't, they never really, some of them never really cared. One of the best mentors that I, had, I ever had, as I said before, was my social worker. I couldn't have access to my social worker anymore, so I had to, like, kind of find a mentor of my own. I wanted to get into business and become an entrepreneur. And the first mentor that put the hand up to help me out with my journey, a person told me, forget about your family, forget about all these things. You know, it's about you, you know. And I said, this is not right. This isn't, isn't right. If you, if I forget about my family, who's going to take care of my family? You know, if I forget about this what I do, who's going to do it, you know? I do understand that you need to be self-aware first before you can seek a mentor. Or if you're not self-aware, you need to seek a mentor that can support you mm. to for you to become self-aware of who you are. And um, these are the motive behind writing the book that I wrote for the mentors and mentees. It's, a, it's about us as individuals learning from other people. I learn from these little kids that I work with. It might be so little, our society today, they'll say you can't learn anything from a from a young person, you know what I mean? But again, I learned a lot of stuff from these little fellas that I worked with. And I consider them as my mentors. Cause I took something for I took a lot of knowledge working with them. So this well. book's not only about what you can teach but what you can learn from the people. Yeah, yeah, know. definitely. So it's like it helped me to become who I am. Mm -hmm. And I think as a mentor and mentees we all have something to learn and we learn from one another so a mentor you might have been through a certain path of life and a mentee hasn't been through those pathways but once you start learning about your mentees stories you're taking notes you're learning you're taking in the knowledge it's giving you understanding of who that person is as a mentee and as well as them learning from you as a mentor you're giving them a knowledge of who you are as a mentor and of your struggles that you've been through and how you overcome those struggles and they can implement those stuff as well. And then there's some, some other mentors that I had in the past, they call me on my phone and say, yo, Chance, what's up? Um, we have this other special program. We're willing, we're wondering if you might be interested in joining it. And the pro program costs $10,000. And I said to the mentor, look, one of my goals was to run a successful business online and you guys are not helping me out with it. And I've paid my money for it. You never call me to talk about that, but you want me to yet buy another program from you guys. Yeah. So that's, some people will use you yeah. in that field. Yeah. So you so, never want to be like that. Yeah. I told them, like, that's not the way mentoring works. I know mentors can't force you to do things. They can't motivate you to do things. But them turning up every day and trying their best to help you out and play the mentor as a mentor play the role as a mentor that is what is going to motivate you to get up on your butt and actually do what you're supposed to be doing mm. and that's why i wrote the book because a lot of people get they get really confused and they do not know how to go on about choosing the right mentors for them and end up having a bunch of like different mentors and they get ripped off or they, they get choose off. the wrong person yeah, they get and, taken advantage of uh, and that's what i did myself and i want to kind of um help other people out uh, there to to try and look deeper into it and um because we all need mentors who's this man in front of me now <laughs> this is chance an author man an author and also a ceo of everyone has a story to tell so I wrote a book on top of that I was working toward starting my own organization so I went on board and I was doing a bit of youth work and on top of that I was working as a core support so I wanted to find out how would kids that have been in care or kids that have grow up with trauma end up when they get older so I work for NDIS as well to um, support a lot of the NDIS participants and I realized that a lot of these kids that never healed from trauma when they're in care, they end up growing into that and end up being becomes in care. a problem. Becomes a problem as they get older, so they do not understand the social norms and how to socially verbalize their emotions into the into the community or to the to themselves and how to deal with their the inner self. I think mm -hmm. that was the problem, because when I reflect that, I could have been one of those kids today. You know, I could have been in that place where I don't know who I am you know I could have been 
in care of myself too you know i could have been like having support workers coming to my doorstep you know knocking at a chance can we take you here do you need support for today you know i worked with older people to be able to understand the two groups two different groups and i did it say after that i was like cool i'm gonna approach this situation and i'm gonna target as many people as i can i'm gonna reach out i don't care who you are harmless not harmless i'm gonna come on the street and i'm gonna talk to you and ask you what you need support with and so that's what your I organization's help. about that's what my organization is all about it's about um working with nda's participants to help them out to um to get uh to get their goals done to accomplish their goals so i have a book that i wrote and i wrote a journal as well so it's a mentoring journal it's called like 300 365 days mentoring sessions where myself as a CEO most of our participants that are the clients that we have at the moment I catch up with them on a weekly basis once a week take them out for coffee or dinner socialize and um, have like uh, that normal life and ask them where you're standing you know like do you need more support do we need to put stuff in places for you you know um but doing it in the right way where yeah. you really care about them and you get that and you've been in that position before yeah so you're actually the support that they really need definitely where can people find out about that uh so i have a website is mentoring which is h h h a s t t mentoring.com my organization provide mentoring sessions academically in community mentoring and yes mentoring and uh and also we do coach support as well and as well as coordination and recovery coach mm. yeah amazing man <laughs> thank you brother <laughs> that thank you it's amazing how far you've come to uh, yeah much appreciated brother that's it for this episode. If you're getting some value out of the show, please help us out with a quick rate and review on Apple Podcasts. Everything we do is recorded in video, so follow Young Blood Men's Mental Health on Instagram and Facebook and Young Blood Mental Health on TikTok. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and please leave us a comment or send us a message if these stories resonate. We'd love to hear from you. You can sign up to our e-news through our website, youngbloodmedia.com.au. And most importantly, please share the podcast with anyone in your life who might need it. We're all about reaching as many people as we can. This is Youngblood. Thanks for being part of the mission. Catch you next time.